Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to our artist talk for our Artists Without Borders exhibition. My name is Graham Reed. I'm the director of exhibitions here at the Museum of Wisconsin Art. And this um, terrific new show that just opened this past Saturday, it's on view here at the Museum of Wisconsin Art in West Bend from April 24th to July 3rd. But as a bonus, we also are expanding the exhibition to our St. Kate Gallery in downtown Milwaukee, and it will be on display at St. Kate's from May 12th until August 1st. Now, as you all know, we are the Museum of Wisconsin Art, and we show Wisconsin artists. And the question often arises when people come to the museum, they always kind of say, well, what qualifies somebody to be a Wisconsin artist? And tonight we have four artists, none of whom were born in Wisconsin, but all are very much what we would consider, and I think they consider themselves, Wisconsin artists. So I'm going to introduce our four guests here tonight. Um, I'm going to do it alphabetically. Nina Ganbarjade uh, finds inspiration by navigating between her native Farsi language and English. She emigrated from Iran to the United States in 2001. Nina is keenly aware of the limitations of language as well as the inherent power and universality of letters and symbols. She finds repetitive mark making to be a meditative process and she invites the viewer to experience the marks as a bridge to shared human experience. David Najib Kassir. David was born in Chicago, but his work is very much rooted in his Arab ancestry. His mother is Syrian, his father Iraqi. He experienced his family's aesthetic and cultural roots during a trip to Syria in 1999, and then subsequently was horrified by that nation's ensuing civil war and his many victims. Using a traditional Arab mosaic design, David poignantly balances the human tragedy with the subtle beauty of tradition. Francisco Mora was an artist from his childhood. His years spent studying in his native Mexico. He studied textiles, printmaking, and painting, and this translated very well to his life and career in the United States, and he arrived in 1980. In his current paintings and drawings, which draw upon Mexican surrealist tradition, he seeks to reconcile past and current events related to his personal experience. And last, by no means least, Zhao Yong Zhang, Chinese-born artist Zhao explores social and political issues that would likely be discouraged in her native China. After completing graduate studies in 2002, Zhao remained in the United States, and she applies Western digital techniques to traditional Chinese art forms, motifs, and symbols. Symbols include the contrast between rich and poor in China, pollution, and environmental issues and the tense political relationship between China and the United States. So those are our four artists that we've got here tonight. And this is a question for all of you. Um, you've all chosen to base your lives and careers here in Wisconsin. Do you think your work might have developed differently had you lived in a different state? And uh, Nina, anybody can jump in, but Nina, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for um, having us on this panel tonight. Uh, very excited and very much honored. Um, uh, first of all, I should say that I did not choose to live and make a living here in Wisconsin. Um, I came here, I came to Wisconsin because I married my husband and he happened to be living in Wisconsin. And um, honestly, I had no idea where Wisconsin was. And when we met back in Iran, there wasn't any internet uh, or Google. So I had to open the map and look into the books and find out, where, okay, where is Wisconsin? Because majority of Iranians, they would immigrate to California, Maryland, you know, Florida. I had never heard of Wisconsin. I knew where Chicago was. <laughs> so I found, okay, this is Wisconsin. And I had no idea that how cold it gets here. Um, we do have winters, we do have snow, and I used to ski in Tehran, but I had no idea that uh, I was going to live in the freezer in the United States. <laughs> uh, 
anyway, it was not uh, my choosing, but after living here in Wisconsin for 20 years since I moved here and uh, started my career in Milwaukee, I think um, I like living here and I don't want to move elsewhere. Uh, but uh, going back to your question, I haven't lived in any other state, but I'm pretty much sure uh, my works would have been somehow different. And I'm saying that because uh, after my immigration, my entire art making has changed. And that is due to the new environment here in the US. And I'm pretty much sure living in a different state would have affected further my art making. I don't know how because I haven't lived in any other state, but I'm pretty much sure environment you know, affects the way we think and live and function. Do you think it might have been different had you gone to California, Maryland, where there was a bigger Iranian population, whereas here, you know, there really isn't, outside of, there is one in Chicago, but do you think the fact that you're in Wisconsin and there isn't quite that, mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that, that there Iranian population to either assimilate with or not assimilate with, depending on your choice, the fact that you are kind of, out on your own to a certain extent. I think so, because when you are living in an environment that you you uh, you don't have, can I use it, You're, you have not found your tribe, if I can use that word. Sure, sure, uh, sure. You don't have a tribe that you feel um, the sense of belonging. So you're always trying to, um, you know, um, make a, uh, make a relationship with the, with the people around you who are not familiar with you and you, you don't know them. And uh, it, it, was a, it has been a challenge for me. I'm pretty much sure if I was amongst more Iranians, I, I would not be having so much challenge in the, in the way I communicate and think and function. Good. Thanks. David, I know you knew where Wisconsin is and you know how cold it got here. So uh, any other state appeal to you to uh, live and work? Well, I mean, uh, I being from Chicago, I knew how cold it already was. I didn't know it can get any colder, though. Uh, <laughs> so that was a little bit of a surprise. But, um, you know, I, I, I came over here... Uh, um, you know, to go to school and um, uh, uh, build, you know, at a very young age, uh, I, I started building a family here uh, with my two daughters. And so, you know, I, I, I did, kind of, you know, I, I don't know if I would have, if I didn't start building a family young, I don't know if I would have stayed here. Um, but you know, uh, you know, I, I'm happy that I have. Uh, you know, I, I really enjoyed the uh, community that we built uh, with other artists in Milwaukee and in Wisconsin. Um, if I were in any other state, would it, would what would the effect of my work would be? I think, I think to a certain degree, I, I would. You know, I mean, the war. My my work deals with the. Uh, the war in in Syria, and that would have had an effect on me no matter where I, I, I would uh, uh, lived. Um, and 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 working with the designs that I do, I you know I mean I, I remember remember being you know uh, you know the a young artist twenty years ago, knowing I was eventually going to end up using it and working with those designs in some way sometime in the future i just at that point i just didn't have a reason to use those designs uh or or know how to speak its language uh and then once the war broke out it uh sort of gave me an excuse to try to uh communicate uh using the designs into the work and, and communicate with what's going on in in uh, syria um so I'm sure there would have been differences if I would have lived anywhere else. Um, but I wouldn't say, I'd say likely not a huge extent. Right, because I remember reading something um, where you basically said, you know, Milwaukee, even though there isn't a big Syrian community in Milwaukee, to be an artist, the kind of cost of living, for want of a better word, term, 
is affordable in Milwaukee. You, you're probably getting a studio and things like that is cheaper in Milwaukee than if you had stayed in Chicago. Right, right. Uh, um, be, being an artist in Milwaukee is very affordable. Uh, you know, I, I get to uh, I, I get to have a great space uh, here, a large studio space, and a, you know, a decent home. You know, a really nice uh, place to live. Having the two and separately, you know, is very. It's a lot easier to have in Milwaukee than other big, bigger cities, likely. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it's also like there's also something very much to the Milwaukee underdog kind of story, you know, and you kind of get, you kind of feel sort of in tune with that or, or secure with that. And so you use that to motivate your work and, 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 uh, and each sort of progressive, uh, you know, career path that you take with your work, if that makes any sense. Francisco, you've been here the longest of all the four artists here tonight. Um, I know, you, I know you've been in Milwaukee almost well, about 40 years now. Any, any other, did you ever have any temptation to go somewhere else? Uh, well, uh, yes, you know, uh, I, I think that's what you said. I've been here for uh, roughly 40 years and counting. Uh, unlike at least the other two panelists, you know, I had the chance and the choice, you know, to stay in, in Wisconsin uh, more than once. You know, I came to Milwaukee, particularly in 1979 for the first time. And uh, I liked it, you know, uh, two of the things that to me were just uh, very impressive, you know, was uh, first the lake, uh, then secondly, uh, the university, uh, and third, believe it or not, the public library. Uh, this was the first place where I saw a, a library that large, that big, where you could take books and take them home, you know, and then bring them back pretty much whenever. So it was, it was, uh, very important, very interesting to me, you know, coming from Mexico to have those three things, you know, ready available. However, it wasn't until 1981 that I decided to move to Wisconsin. Uh, back then, I have to say that uh, the rules and regulations about immigrations you know, were a little bit less aggressive than they are today. So it was very easy for me to get my green card and eventually uh, get my citizenship. Although, as you know, I didn't become a citizen, but until almost 20 years after. So for 20 years, you know, I just, uh, I was just a resident, you know, and I, I loved it. That is also because I always thought, you know, that I would sometime will go back to Mexico. Uh -huh. uh, and so that's how I ended up here, you know. And again, as I said, two or three times I had to ch you know, choose if I want to stay here or not. I moved once to New Mexico and I spent a couple of years living in Santa Fe. And then I came back, you know. And then like two or three years later, I decided to move to San Diego, California. And so the same thing, you know, I spent a couple of years there and then I decided to come back. Then I actually went back to Mexico, you know, for almost a year and then, you know, came back again. So, you know, something keeps uh, bringing me back. I, I do have to say, you know, that I like Wisconsin. One of the things that I like perhaps the most is nature. You know, you are at about... Uh, 10 minutes, you know, out of the city and you're in the woods, there's there's deer, there's, uh, you know, any kind of animal you can imagine, you know, some some of them even called pests, you know, like squirrels, which I love, or possums, raccoons, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So nature was also uh, very important for me. What about you, Zhao? Um, I was offered a teaching job at the University of Wisconsin Whitewater. Uh, after I graduated from SIU in 2002. So I have been here for 19 years. Um, it's hard for me to imagine how would I develop differently in another state since I, didn't, I don't have a chance to make a comparison. Uh, I came to the United States and I live here. 
in the beginning, I feel Wisconsin is extremely, extremely cold. And also, as we know, Wisconsin, uh, because my teacher heard about Wisconsin, and she told me, oh, Wisconsin is about the barns and the cows. And it's countryside. Originally, I came from Beijing, it's a big city. Uh, so uh, I feel it's really difficult for me to get use of the countryside style of life in the beginning. But eventually, I love it. One thing for sure right now, I start to enjoy uh, four season living in Wisconsin, and our kids love Wisconsin. And they always say, home sweet home. So right now, I, I feel like I love Wisconsin. But in the beginning, no, I, I feel it's very, very cold, extremely cold. It's funny, there, are, there, are, there isn't a single barn or a single cow in this whole exhibition. I mean, really. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, you know, because I, you know, obviously I'm, a, I'm an immigrant myself, and a lot I've been in the states now oh, for. And the important thing I want to share with everyone is, in California, and uh, I try to ask people, you know, uh, where I can find a conference room. The person asked me, "Where are you from?" I said, "Wisconsin," and the people look at my face just like, "Where is Wisconsin?" So I was, it's hard for me to understand why the people live in the California, they don't know where is the Wisconsin. So this is the first time I feel Wisconsin uh, actually uh, is far, far, far from the big city. <laughs> so, but I love Wisconsin right now, yeah. So none of you are planning on leaving at any time soon? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not because my job here, my career is here, my kids is, my kid are here. And yeah, you've, I feel, you've, all made, you've all made lives here, I think that's probably yeah, the yeah. thing to say. Yes, exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, we've got one more question for you all and then I'm going to ask some more individual mm -hmm. questions. But some of you have been in the U.S. for a long time, yet issues of assimilation and borders, whether real or perceived, still come through in your work. As we live in an ever intimately connected world, for example, during the, the production, putting this show together, I was, um, con I was, I was corresponding with Nirmal when she was in India, and I was uh, communicating with her as easily as I would communicate with any of you by email. Do you think um, this will ever change? Do you think the gulf between virtual connectivity and real connectivity will disappear? Anybody can jump in at this one. Uh, I can talk about, you know, I feel like, although I feel the face to face and also human touch is very important and cannot be replaced easily. But to me personally, uh, you know, the pandemic and the lockdown and make me believe uh, remote and the vir virtual communication has become a new style uh, to stay in touch, no matter where we are in the world. So I feel like in the future, uh, it can be a trend. This is what I thought, yeah. Yeah, I think it has forced us to find alternative means of communication rather than the usual face-to-face -face personal interactions. Um, I would say it can be a trend. It can be a trend. Yeah, I don't know. Let's see. Yeah. David, David, were you going to say something there? I mean, I was going to say. Um, I mean, I, I'm I'm kind of now trying to get used to. I, I have a, a my younger daughter now lives in New Zealand, and so I'm I'm, I'm sure we'll be sort of connecting in you know through video screens as much as possible to feel you know as close as we can uh, to each other. And so uh, I'm hoping technology, you know, helps in that way. And so I'm sure, you know, intercontinental living makes, you know, makes it easier to connect and, and, and uh, makes the world feel a little smaller, you know, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, the internet obviously makes the world smaller than it was than when we, when I was young, you know, very young. 
Right, and to a certain extent, when you think about it, the internet and modern technology essentially makes borders disappear. I mean, when I came over here in 1990, it was judiciously timed phone calls and written letters, and now it's now it's Skype or email, and you can just go back and forwards whether they're a thousand well, miles away or the other side of the world. I think, I think, I think also within educating yourself. Uh, with what another country is. I mean, you could, you know, I mean, people didn't know what, you know, Syria, Iran, or Iraq, or any of these, you know, Middle Eastern countries really were, or who they, who the people were, uh, you know, when I was a kid, there would just be certain uh, stereotypes and, 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 you know, caricatures of, of them. I think now you can look, you know, the internet makes it easier to where you can do your research and, and uh, you know, educate yourself on, uh, on, on, you know, the environment, the people, the culture and, and uh, food that and actually, all that. That actually kind of leads me to the, the first question I actually had for you specifically, David, was that you obviously maintain links to friends and family overseas and your work draws very heavily on this situation in Syria. Do you, see, I mean, do you see the civil war as a constant theme going forward? And to what extent do you see the Syrian situation as perhaps being, you know, applicable elsewhere or almost universal? You know, um, with with the series, you know, I, I started out the series just as a as a way of of, of you know just me being frustrated with with. Uh, how it wasn't being covered he, here in, in in the states in America, um, you know, it, it was going on at that time for for years, and uh, and it was you know the, the the war started as an effect from what what happened with the American involvement in Iraq, and so I, I felt it was sort of certain it was a certain way of America sort of wiping their hands from it and ignoring like it like it's not happening and, and, and they have nothing to do with it. And I, w I was really frustrated at that and I wanted to draw attention to it uh, in any way I can. And, and as an artist, you know, art being the only way I know how to communicate, uh, I, I, started, I, I started using the work. Um, so, so I, I didn't know how, you know, I didn't know how I was going to go about it or I didn't know how long I was going to go about it. But with the, every year, the war just got worse and worse and worse. And still to this day, you know, things are happening that aren't being covered. You know, people are still dying. People are, are still not able to, uh, you know, uh, get back into their homes or, you know, you know, we still have the refugee uh, crisis, you know, uh, with Syrian camps and stuff like that. And, and and so I don't know how long my uh, as a subject matter that that that's going to be applying to me. It, it just goes as long as I feel like I need to talk about it and make people aware of it. Um, where it goes from to other subjects or other relationships in the world, I'm not really sure. All I know is that in my work, I need to feel connected to it. I need to. I need to have a uh, relationship to it to be able to give respect on that subject to communicate it in the right way. I, that I, think makes sense. I think that's one of the great things about your work as well. It is Syria specific. You see mothers holding children, people holding babies. And I think, you know, you could take those characters out of your picture and put them in Mexico and Guatemala, you could put them in. Exactly, you, yeah. You could, you could put them in half a dozen places around the world. Right. Um, just change the just change the the kind of um, the uh, mosaic motifs, and and there's a universality to them. I think. Likely, likely so, and and I mean, and part of the uh, uh, reasons that I'm probably able to talk to use. Uh, you know, uh, figures of, of, of parenting and, and, and children is being in, uh, being a parent myself. I, I, I can identify with with uh, um, 
with what it takes to, or the horror, the idea of, of, of uh, trying to help your family survive, something like that. Right. The desperation that comes with it. Sure. Speaking of um, kind of universality, Francisco, obviously COVID-19 has been a global pandemic and your work has been a direct response to it. Tell us about how your pandemic drawings came to pass and your use of masks as both um, object and motif. And do you see this as a, a theme that you're going to go forward with? Or do you think as the pandemic relents slightly that you know, you'll know you just kind of put that aside as, well, that was my pandemic work? Uh, I, I think the, the later, you know, I think that eventually it will just become uh, my pandemic work. Uh, I have to say, you know, that I have always liked to work in series, you know, sometimes four, six, eight, twelve, you know. And uh, this might be because I like the the narrative, you know, that it's created, you know, uh, behind them. One idea sort of uh, translates into a second one and overlaps, you know, and continues adding to the original story. I think, you know, that I understood this uh while working in children books. And, uh, you know, you learn about how to create a character and how to stage that character, the developing, you know, and of, of course, you know, at the end, uh, a, a positive ending. In the case of the, the pandemic drawings, you know, was kind of the same idea. I started with uh, one drawing and uh, it uh, by itself, you know, created a character a character that kept telling me kind of where to go, you know. Uh, definitely there's some desperation uh, in the drawings, you know, due to the uh, isolation, you know, and the, the fear, uh, the quarantine, uh, the virus, you know. And so it becomes, you know, uh, a personal conversation. I, I would not know how to describe it otherwise. Uh, when we first started uh, listening about COVID-19, uh, the, the comments on TV, of course, you know, were, were very wide, very broad. You know, uh, I kept hearing that uh, the virus could come into your body uh, via your eyes, your nose, your mouth, you know, uh, wash your hands, don't touch your face, wear goggles, wear masks. I, I saw people wearing uh, plastic hats, you know, gloves and uh, raincoats, you know, all sorts of things, you know, there was such a panic uh, mm -hmm. about the COVID. And of course, you know, uh, with, of course, uh, with the vaccine and, and uh, uh, the understanding of how the virus works, you know, people started uh, becoming more relaxed. But I also found, you know, that, uh, and, and this is something that I thought I had found it on my own, you know, but later I saw that many artists were doing the same thing and, uh, you know, portraying these fears and uh, uh, their solution, perhaps, you know, into into the making of masks. And uh, the last mask that, that, I, uh, that I'm showing there with you, it's the Holy Heart of Jesus where I thought, you know, you have to cover all the angles. It's not just the mask, but your soul and, uh, you know, your faith, your religion, everything has to come in place. The vaccine might not be enough. Mm -hmm. And so they became a little bit humorous, you know, and, and I kind of don't mind it, you know. I, I think that that was a good way of coping with. But again, as I said, I think the this will be called the pandemic drawings, the pandemic masks. I'm sure there's a lot more coming from that source, but as of now, uh, probably no more masks. Drawings for sure. Okay. Now, the masks, you know, open the alternative to work with found objects and uh, uh, 3D, you know, so that, that allowed me to open a different door. And now I'm, I'm trying to create some toys you know, toys that I think will reflect also the quarantine. So well, I think I think one thing that I, it just struck me there is that um, your pandemic drawings and the they're black and white, and you know, so much of your work is is colorful. It's you know, it's bright, it's colorful, and you know, the serious work it's it's black and white. There's no color there. Was that a conscious decision? 
Uh, yes, of course, by, by all means, you know, I, uh, it's a learning process. Uh, I, I don't know, you know, okay, when, when I was in school, you know, that of course means absolutely nothing because you very much make your own, your own school as you go. But we were told, you know, that uh, the, the line drawing the black, you know, was, was the body of things and the color was the soul of things. So, you know, if you wanted to incorporate more soul into your painting or drawing or whatever, you needed to add color. But if you want to go for the body, which for me was the flesh, you know, things, I thought, you know, black and white was the was the way to go. The other thing, you know, is that I have always liked things that are immediate. You know, I used to work a lot in watercolor because five minutes into the process, you know if it's going to work or not. You know, you, you mix the wrong color, splash, you know, water, everything or whatever. And goes to the trash it, it's you know there's no way to to fix things so uh ink on paper you know became very interesting you know as a, a spontaneous you know expression of what i was trying to say yep. well, speaking of black and white and pen and ink on paper nina you've talked about still kind of constantly translating from farsi to english and back and forwards for many years is this still the case and which language um, now comes first? Yeah, um, my first language obviously is, uh, has been and will always be Farsi, uh, Persian. The correct word is Farsi uh, in my house because it doesn't feel uh, natural to me if I wanted to speak in English with my family. Um, so obviously it's Farsi and will always be Farsi. Um, translation, that's a good question. Uh, there are, there has been, and there will be many times that I still need to find the translation of some words and phrases and slangs. Uh, when we watch TV, sometimes I just don't understand a specific word. So I have to ask my husband. Or when I read something, I have to, you know, look through the dictionary to find the meaning or vice versa. Uh, but it's more apparent to me when I want to translate uh, something from my language to English, uh, especially when it comes to um, poetry and literature, because there is no way that you can translate the sensibility of the language. You can translate word by word, but what about the feeling, the emotions that comes with that thing, you know? So um, I have to translate from Farsi to English and English to Farsi back and forth a few times and think about it and make sure that what I read in English, uh, I get the same feeling when I read that thing in Farsi or vice versa. I would just put up this sentence as written in two languages, which was one of the pieces you had in the biennial last year. Mm -hmm. Do you ever uh, uh, find yourself like, you know, mixing both? Like I would catch my mom uh, speaking to somebody in Arabic and then she'd throw in English words in there. And I would tell my mom, I'm like, mom, she doesn't understand what you just said. You said it in English. And she wouldn't oh. realize that she did that. Many times, many times, especially when my uh, daughter hangs out with her friends. So I walk into their room and uh, I'm speaking in Farsi. And then I look at my daughter's friend and I continue speaking Farsi. And Mona tells me, Mom, she doesn't understand Farsi. <laughs> Switch to English. I say, okay, sorry. I, I remember one time coming back from Syria, um, somebody asked me and my sister something in English and uh, some some American kid and uh, something about my sister. And then we said the same thing. My, my sister and I, my other sister and I said, uh, answered at the same time in Arabic without realizing we said it in Arabic. Mm -hmm. It's a weird, yeah. Just, just for clarification, what is the difference between Farsi and Arabic? Um, so there are two different languages. Uh, visually, when you look at them at first glance, um, you may think that this is Arabic, but it's not. 
the similarity is we use the same Arabic uh, characters or alphabets. The difference is we have 32 letters. Uh, Arabic language has 28. So there are four distinct letters that does, does not exist in Arabic. And those four letters, uh, with those you create specific sounds that doesn't exist in Arabic. Okay. But it doesn't mean that they are similar. I mean, uh, everything is so different. Mm -hmm. And because we are using same characters, it doesn't mean that we can uh, read either or the other language. You have to really learn how to read and write Arabic or Farsi. Okay, okay. So it's not a case of, oh, if you're a natural born Farsi speaker that, or reader that you can just switch over and, and read Arabic. No, 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 okay. no. Right, right, uh, right now at schools in Iran, they teach Arabic to the students because um, the, the Holy Book Quran is written in Arabic, so it's required uh, for the students to learn so they can read Quran if they want to. Zhao, you are currently a, a green card holder. What was the tipping point for you to seek permanent residency here? And you're also, your work deals with US-China relations, which are simultaneously beneficial to both countries, but also simultaneously detrimental. Do you think you could make the work that you do if you were still in China? Um, first, I answer your first question. Uh, well, uh, you know, I have kept a uh, green card status for 10 years uh, since I did, uh, you know, to see my parents who are getting old. Uh, so the green card status will allow me to travel back to China without applying for a visa each time. But as you know, apply for visa is very expensive. Uh, can be a couple of hundred dollars, but right now the price gets higher and higher. So that is the reason I have kept a green card for 10 years. As we know, I haven't traveled back to China for two years because of the pandemic. So I, I don't need to travel. Uh, I, I think about I haven't traveled to, for two years, maybe for a lot of two years, they have a travel restriction between China and the U.S. I think it's right now is the right time for me to apply for permanent residency in U.S. Because both my kids were, were born and raised here, and my job and career is here. Wisconsin is my home. So that's the reason I apply, uh, you know, a permanent residency this year. And uh, I, I think, you know, because Wisconsin has been my home, so you talk about my work, uh, about the U.S. and the China relation. Uh, I don't work with t this type of subject uh, if I stay in China, because I don't feel like, you know, if I stayed in China, any political issues will influence my life. But right now I am in the U.S. So the relationship between China and the U.S. impacts my life. Uh, you know, deeply. I started to make this piece in two, uh, 1999. Actually, you know, very early, I made three. And gradually in the 2000, I made four or five. Until Grant uh, tell me uh, he has big interest for that piece, I start to make 10. So, <laughs> because as we know, um, because the growing tension between the U.S. and China in the past year has increased the uh, hate crimes against the Asian Americans, and uh, you know, for the past year, for myself is, uh, you know, I was I have my personal emotions. You can see the fear, crime, death, so many things. So the people always ask me, Shao, what do you want to say? Is this about the U.S. and China?" I do including a uh, historical image. Uh, I dig out from uh, like 40, 50 years ago with copyright image from China. And the current image I have, uh, you know, I make some uh, image, I scan money, I scan uh, US dollar, I scan RMB. So I want to express my emotion. And if someone asks me, what do you want to say? I said, this is about year 2020, and you can find something from here. 
So I don't want to convince you what I want to say. I feel like this is my feeling, upset, big upset. And, you know, I, I feel like, you know, a year and make me feel like, you know, every day I read my news, I always have, you know, feeling and like pressure, high pressure, feel fear also, you know, like a gunshot somewhere and, you know, anything. I, I believe 2020, all I read from news is bad news. I'm sorry. So it's a really tough year for me. Could you tell yeah. us um, a little bit about your process here? I mean, with all due respect to um, the other artists, we can see that it's pen or pencil or uh, paint on canvas or paper. Could you just tell us a little bit about your technique here, about how you actually create these images? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I teach a uh, digital foundation at the UW Whitewater. So as the foundation class, um, we always encourage students to use different image to uh, make a you know artistic and a new medium piece. So I also very familiar with like a software like Photoshop, Illustrator, and Maya because this is part of my job. So uh, in the end of semester, I usually give students final project in order to inspire them to work with the software, work with the subject, and uh, I usually do a demo. So many, many of my work are class uh, demo for students. So this is work is about the class classroom demo. I try to use multiple image and tell them what is about color balance, and then I use effects. So this is about software. I use software effects to create a, you know, really, uh, I would say, uh, 3D look effects. Yeah, to create a, like a busy pressure, those kind of thing. So uh, yeah, this is, that's it. It's class assignment <laughs> and then for me. The last question I had for you is water and pollution are particularly themes that I think we're going to have in your work that's going to be at St. Kate's. Obviously, water and pollution um, respect no borders. Is this a theme subject that you kind of see yourself pursuing? Um, actually, uh, everybody see my earlier work, I do paper cutting. So uh, I use paper and the traditional Chinese paper cutting and, you know, to make a, you know, silver ad of the person. Uh, I focus my, uh, on my personal narratives, but later I start to address a broader themes such as impact of wars, water and the pollution, environment issue, uh, and, you know, um, the poor in China. And right now, I would say focus on critical engagement from uh, an East Midwest perspective. And meanwhile, interest uh, for new media art. <coughs> so I'm thinking about look for unconventional uh, mediums. Uh, like, you know, maybe I, I'm thinking about programming and think about installation. I even think about if I can work with a scientist to uh, explore the new material and to is express my artistic principles because my job is new media. So that's the reason I, my teaching and the daily life uh, has changed my creation procedure. I don't know what is the next. Maybe right now, uh, I think my current project, I based on uh, like, um, 3D uh, and also data visualization. So I, you'll see, you'll see. I always try to make a little bit of change. Okay. Yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of finish off with probably kind of the hypothetical, impossible to answer question, but what kind of work do you think you might be making if you were in China, Iran, Syria, or Mexico? If you all of a sudden went back to China, Iran, Syria, or Mexico, do you, how, how differently do you think you might work? Nina, you look like you're about I to mean, say something. David. Uh, no. Sorry. Um, 
I think um, if I would have stayed back in Iran, my works would not be about uh, uh, using language in my art and communication because I would be living amongst people who are using one language only. There wasn't any need for me to translate back and forth. Uh, but one thing is for sure, uh, I have always uh, uh, loved and I still love minimal art. And when I look at my um, art that I made like more than 20 years ago, I still see the trace of minimalism in a way. My love for lines and dots, you know, um, and, um, you know, uh, uh, deleting, um, the unnecessary information, that is the essence of my work. And I can see that, that that would continue in a different way, but not in the form of language. Okay, good. Nina, I'd be interested in seeing what your work uh, looked like when you were in Iran before you came here. You haven't seen any? No, I don't think I have. I'd be interested in seeing it. If you, oh, sure. If you want to share with me. Oh, absolutely. I would uh, love to share those with you. I have only a few paintings here with me. Majority of them burned. My parents, they had a house north of Iran, like a summer house. And uh, there was a huge fire. Majority of my painting destroyed in that fire. So only a few survived. And my dad um, brought them here. I have some of those with me. But uh, sure, I would love to share those with you one day. David, any idea what you might paint if um, you were suddenly if I were in Syria? You know, I, I do follow some uh um a couple of Syrian uh artists in and in, in um in Syria. Uh and I've noticed the ones who sort of speak in the same language that I do uh, uh, you know, politically aware and, or socially aware, uh, and, and uh, use that as a language in their work. I noticed that they're no longer in Syria, um, knowing that it wasn't, you know, if they were going to continue their work, they would was not safe for them to be in Syria. Sure. Um, the artists that I have seen that stayed in Syria basically, um, you know, it's more figurative work, you know, or, uh, you know, still lifes and stuff like that, um, which wouldn't have interested me to um, uh, sort of pursue to, or, or be the basis of my work. So I'm sure uh, doing what I do, I would not have been able to stay in the current form of, of Syria. So without being cliched about it, living here gives you the freedom to really do what you want and comment on what you want. Without being cliche about it, yeah. Uh, um, uh, there, there are other places that uh, there are. Uh, there are plenty of uh, countries uh, where I, I could have also been afforded that. But yes, yes. Francisco, what about you? Do you think you would uh, be kind of doing the same thing if you'd stayed in Mexico? Uh, well, I, I, I do think it will stay the same. You know, I, uh, I find the source for my work, you know, inside of me, you know, so uh, I don't think that would change much. However, if it does, I would be very, very happy because that would probably meant that I have learned something. But uh, yeah, you know, in Mexico, there's there's a lot of work that is being produced nowadays that is just, you know, out of the ordinary. So yeah, I, I would love to make some changes. Okay. Zhao? So, uh, I would say I probably do conventional painting and drawing if I stay in China uh, because we got a big influence by the Russian art when I stay in the college in China. Uh, so we focus on skill very much. For example, we focus on realistic style, space, positive, negative. And I came to the United States and uh, the education in the US encouraged me to uh, create something uh, and have my own language and also build my, uh, I would say, my personal uh, art language. So that's the reason I started to do paper cutting in, in the US. 
And gradually, my teaching required me to change to a new medium. But right now, I try to merge everything. So the good thing is, I started to cross different uh, like art forms, cross the disciplines. Uh, this is my current situation. So I would say in China, I would say you can see I do all your painting or like a landscape or like trees, figures, very realistic style. style. So I start to draw when I was 15. But right now, suddenly I lost part of my drawing skill because I didn't draw. I always use computer. So this is something I feel bad. So I, I feel like maybe I should keep drawing every day still because I lost my uh, conventional, powerful drawing skill right now since I sit on my computer, work with the computer every day. So <laughs> my next year's plan is uh, try to draw every week. Yeah, I want to combine everything, yeah. I did that too, uh, just as a painter, I lost my drawing skills and I uh, ended up uh, creating a sketchbook where I would just draw people to, to um, or friends of mine, just to get that skill back. And it's a strange thing, you don't realize how much of a muscle it is that you need to keep on working to to uh, to keep because you just, you know, some, some part of you just assumes like, well, yeah, I can, I can always draw. But no, not if you're. If, uh, yeah, it, it's just it's just a muscle you got to keep keep it going. Uh, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's a it's a funny thing to see how bad I was at one point when I started that sketchbook and and it got better. Not 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 not, not great, but better than it was. Yeah. So other than drawing, working on your drawing skills, uh, just like a last comment from each of you about. Um, being in this exhibition and the work that you're uh, that you have in the show. Just a quick recap. Um, just a quick recap. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I really, you know, I'm, I'm very honored to be a part of the uh, uh, exhibition to be among these, uh, uh, you know, great Milwaukee, Wisconsin artists. Um, you know, it's a great, it, it, it's a great exhibit. I, I encourage everybody to make it out there. Um, uh, and I'm looking forward to the, uh, um, to it come also coming to St. Kate's. Yep. All right. Well, just to recap for everyone, the, uh, exhibition will be, uh, there it is. It's right up on the screen. It's up on till May, it opens on May 12th at MOA DTN in the St. Kate Hotel, and it is on view right now up here in West Bend until July the 3rd. So again, our website for any more information is wisconsinart.org, and thanks to our exhibition sponsors, the Greater Milwaukee Foundation and Wisconsin Humanities. And again, thank you so much to Nina, David, Francisco, and Zhao for your time tonight. Um, and we have a question from Sam Tim. Um, it's a question for anyone who wants to answer. What challenges are you facing in your practice right now? Anybody want to answer? Um, other, than, other than working on your drawing skills. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, can, I can go first. Sure. Um, yeah. So um, since I started my career as an artist um, right after my graduation from UWM in 2013, I always had a studio space in Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. And um, since the, this of January, I decided to give away my space. And um, that was my personal choice, personal reason for that. And um, it's been really difficult not to be amongst my fellow artists in Milwaukee. And that's something that I really, really miss. The interaction, the conversations, and just, you know, hanging out with my artist friends in Milwaukee. That's been really hard. Uh, but uh, as an artist, I think, um, I think that we all, all the artists, we are all being challenged, you know, on a daily basis, one way or the other. You know what to make next. You know what kind of material should I, you know, you know, use? Uh, how to push myself? Uh, where do I come? This, you know, where do I find the new ideas? You know, for my new 
for the next exhibition. So these are um, challenges that we face every day in our studios. But um, as I said, not having a space in Milwaukee is really hard right now. And I'm hoping to find another space in the future. Okay. I think there's always room over here at bar, by the way. Um, yes. Um, you know, I, I, I will second that as like trying to challenge and, and, and uh, move the work forward. Um, challenging is, I, I think the times have been really challenging to uh, uh, keep making work and, you know, in the, in the last year uh, during, uh, you know, the, the, the shutdown of life, everything felt very disconnected and, um, and I, I, I came to the studio every day to, to work and make, but it was, it, it, it was just a really sort of, uh, it, was, it never felt exactly comfortable uh, be, because I think when I work, I, I need sort of the outside presence and without having the outside presence, it, uh, I think, I think the studio just felt a little bit more uh, dissolute uh, in and darker in here and and so you know i i think i think with the, the world sort of bombarding you with you know the pandemic the violence and everything else all the craziness uh, uh politically socially going on it's sort of hard to it's 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 hard to be sort sort in a certain way, like mentally, um, mentally okay, and 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 keep working. If that makes any sense. Very much so. You know, I I feel the same way about a studio space. I I don't have a studio. Uh, in fact, I lost mine about two years ago. I'm counting, and. Uh, Right now, I work out of a little table that I have in my bedroom. And uh, but you know, the important thing is is to produce. So it doesn't really matter. You know, the scale has changed. Uh, certain materials, of course, have changed because I cannot uh, mix oils or or you know things with high fumes inside of my bedroom. But uh, but I certainly can't use Elmer's glue. You know, anytime. So. A studio space would be very important. It's a challenge, you know. But at the same time, you know, with the again with the pandemic, you know, uh, or pandemia, uh, it has given me the opportunity, you know, of using my isolation uh, to produce. So in a way, it's uh, you know, 2020 or 5050. It's it's good to be isolated because you can produce. But it would be nicer to become more socially active, you know, and have a larger space. Zhao? Uh, actually, or? I have a multiple challenge. First of all, uh, technology. Because I teach new media area. Uh, and also, I feel like the field change every day. So I have to learn always. I have a tons of book. I have to watch uh, videos, go to different uh, lessons. And I feel sometimes I feel very tired. So this is first the challenge in new technology. Second challenge is the time. I'm not a professional artist. Uh, you know, I am a teacher. So that's the reason I, uh, I have, uh, you know, I have a full time teaching job. Uh, so I feel like I don't have much time to do my professional artwork during the normal se se semester because uh, we were in the teaching school. We have three courses. We have service. I think this is very normal. But I'm I'm still lucky. I I I have a work. So what I do is I try to work very hard in the summer and the winter to make more work. I feel like I don't have enough work. I feel I need more, 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 more. So I always think about uh, create more. Yeah. One more a question from Leila Musai. Where locally in Wisconsin best you best reminds you of your home in Iran, Mexico, China, or Syria? Obviously not the winters. Um, 
I can go first because um, Iran is mentioned first uh, in the list of the uh, name of the countries. Um, um, I would say, well, of course, um, you know, the what's the name of the place where you go uh, uh, skiing um, is close to us. Well, well, there's one just here next to West Bend. There's the Sunbar Ski Hill. Yeah, but it's a very, very, very smaller version of what we have uh, close to Tehran where we would go skiing. But uh, one place that reminds me of north of Iran, uh, because people, majority of people here, they have no idea that Iran has uh, so many uh, cli different climate uh, regions. North of Iran is very similar to um, I would say Florida. It's uh, very lush, very green. So there is this scenic road in driftless area. It's a windy road that you know you start at the bottom of the valley and you drive all this you know winding road and you go up on the hill and you drive down. Um, it's it's really really magical and beautiful. And every time we drive that those roads, me and my husband, we always think back and. It's a reminder of, you know, north of Iran. My husband actually was born and raised in north of Iran on Caspian Sea. So um, that place reminds me of uh, those areas. And uh, Leila, thank you for asking that question. Hi, Leila. Anybody else want to answer the question about um, what, what part of Wisconsin reminds you of... Uh, of home, I, I I would say, I'm I, Wisconsin is so different from anywhere I've been in in the Middle East. I would I would you know, I I I, I wouldn't say I, I would see any anything that reminds me of uh, anywhere I've been in Syria, Lebanon, or anywhere else over there. Um, the, the, the only thing I would say is is, is close is like maybe uh, maybe like outside di dining and stuff, uh, you know, something like that when I would see that in the summer. That's yeah, the, the question has a bit of a kind of a geographical focus, but what about the people? You know, I've only certain, kind of become more aware of the, uh, um, uh, of the Arab population here in, in, in Wisconsin in the last couple of years. Um, I'm still, you know, I'm still like learning to meet more people. Um, uh, when I first moved here, I didn't know that there were any Arabs in in in, uh, in Wisconsin. Um, but I've worked with uh, some um, refugee organizations over here uh, uh, a couple years ago, or at least four years ago, uh, when uh, uh, especially when Trump first took office. Um, and so I got to meet a lot of, uh, you know, the Arab, uh, um, community, uh, through that. And, uh, and so they've gotten to sort of know me and, and my work. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, you know, they, I think they got to experience, uh, maybe, maybe be a little bit, uh, you know, there, there, it's, it's, it's a weird thing because like I, I grew up. I grew up in in the Chicago in Chicago in the Chicago land area, but even with the Arab community over there, where we were, we had a very you know uh, big and, and tight community. But growing up, you know, I, I at, at a certain certain point, I grew up. I, I was in a very white neighborhood, and so I you know the assimilation into that white neighborhood was kind of made me feel very different from the other Arabs. And also by being in an Arab community, I was in, in going to an Arab or going to a white, you know, public school or uh, and living in there, you know, I, I felt I was very different from there also. So it was like sort of being the in between the two, if that makes any sense. Oh, it makes total sense. Yep. All right. Well, just again, one thank you once again for your wonderful work in this exhibition. Being such a pleasure to work with you all, and thank you for participating in tonight's talk. And for everybody who's sitting at home watching and listening to this, thank you very much for tuning in.
good night, and hopefully we'll see you at the exhibition. Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.